I just wanted to let you know a little bit about what neuromodulation is and who we are as an organization. And I will be, uh, I hope, extremely quick. Um, uh, I've already had a wonderful introduction, so I won't go through that. Uh, one thing that I wanted to make the point of is the fact that Australia and New Zealand are big international players in this field of neuromodulation. And so you have some incredible expertise here, uh, right at home. Uh, so many things people say, well, I've got to go to Germany, or I've got to go to the United States, or Switzerland, or whatever it is for. Uh, for the therapies that I'm going to be talking about, you have some of the world's experts right here. And uh, the, the, our program chairman, uh, Dr. Mark Russo, is in the back of the room, and, and he's helped to put together a wonderful meeting here. Um, but also, you can see um, all of these uh, wonderful uh, doctors from Australia and New Zealand, and you see Dr. Christellis, we'll be talking more later, um, who have really uh, helped to put the INS on the map here in Australia and New Zealand. So I just want the, the journal of the, the INS um, is called Neuromodulation, no big surprise. The subtitle is Technology at the Neural Interface, where technology interfaces with the nervous system. And I, just to get a sense for the breadth of what neuromodulation can do, for decades, neuromodulation was viewed purely as a pain therapy. And as you've heard, it's a wonderful pain therapy. And it can help people uh, much better than alternative therapies if people are candidates for it. Um, but it's not just that. And so uh, if you look, we have uh, the field of neuroprosthetics, which is part of neuromodulation. Uh, artificial eyes, artificial ears, artificial sensory implementation, we just had a presentation in the other room about using neuromodulation to make paraplegics walk again. Um, all of these things are not pain management and yet express the breadth of the tremendous field of neuromodulation. We have brain stimulation. And traditionally, and you will hear later today about brain stimulation for movement disorders like Parkinson's disease, which is a life-changing therapy. But at the same time, people are now using brain stimulation <coughs> to treat anorexia, bulimia, addiction, obesity, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder. All of these things have undergone rigorous evaluation and are entering the world of general medical therapy. We have a section on spasticity and movement disorders with the spine which involved drug administration systems, implanted drug pumps. And again, sometimes those are used to treat with medications for pain, but there are also medications that we can put into the pumps that eliminate the spasticity of spinal cord injury or multiple sclerosis or uh, some of these other disorders where patients may not be debilitated by the disease itself, but simply by the spasticity. And by controlling the spasticity, they can lead more normal lives. Uh, the bulk of the early presentations today will be on using spinal techniques like spinal cord stimulation to treat chronic pain disorders. And that's what neuromodulation has best been uh, known for. But we also have peripheral nerve stimulation, and peripheral nerve stimulation is now widely used for the treatment of chronic facial pain, for headaches, uh, both cluster headaches and chronic migraine headache. Cardiovascular disorders, we don't usually think of spinal cord <coughs> stimulation as a treatment for cardiac ischemia. But in fact, there are studies that show that the cardiac bypass works less well than spinal cord stimulation at preventing future heart attacks, at decreasing the severe pain that's not controlled with medications that come from cardiac ischemia. And so here we would think of this as a neurologic treatment, and yet we're treating cardiac disorders. There is a growing field 
using spinal cord stimulation to control fecal incontinence and uh, obstructive GI disorders. Um, this is life-changing to, to young people and, and older people at that whose entire activities are built around their bowel program so they aren't defecating uncontrollably in public. And with many of these patients, a simple spinal cord stimulator can give them full control of their bowel. Genital urinary disorders are now a very well-established indication for neuromodulation. Using a single simple wire that is put in through a hole in the spine that's already there called the S3 foramen. Typical uh, a doctor language, foramen is Latin for hole. So right, put a needle in that hole, put in a wire in that hole, turn it on, and you can treat the majority of patients who have urinary incontinence or urinary difficulties as a result of any of a number of disorders. Um, I mentioned headache. There is an ever-growing field of doing these things non-invasively, particularly with people being afraid of having a brain surgery to put in a brain stimulator to control these disorders. There's more and more work being done on doing these things non-invasively. And as our technology improves, many of these things will become less and less invasive. And so this broad field is what we are trying to manage and address and educate the public about so people know about it. Because if you go to most general practitioners, if you go to most uh, medical societies, they, they kind of maybe have heard about that once, but we've not done a great job in educating the public and our referring doctors about this. So the International Neuromodulation Society is, is, is growing rapidly. We now have almost 3,000 members, and more than a third of them will be here at this meeting. There are 23 uh, national or regional chapters. Um, more than 50 countries are represented. Um, this shows just how rapidly the society is growing. Uh, these are some of the chapters around the, country, uh, around the world. And we are adding new chapters as we speak. And our goal, of course, is to try not only to get very well-developed westernized countries like the United States and Australia, but to make sure that around the world people have access to these important therapies. We have a number of committees that are directed at trying to address all these issues. And I really show this slide only to show number nine. Um, how focused an effort we have to ensure that we have appropriate uh, gender recognition and uh, uh, concerns about making sure that the society is inclusive um, as well as productive. Um, I won't go into any more detail about that. So the bottom line is, what does the society do? Well, we do a lot of research trying to prove new therapies to help our patients. We educate. And hopefully this will be a, a, an opportunity for us not only to tell you about some of the various things we can do with neuromodulation, but hopefully you will take that and, and let your families and friends know as well, because that's how awareness spreads. Uh, we perform quality assurance. We work hard to make sure that our members are properly trained and that they're doing the right thing by their patients. We work tirelessly for patient access. We work not only with insurance companies, but governments and healthcare plans around the world trying to make sure that these uh, devices are approved and that we're allowed to take this sophisticated technology and put it in the hands of our patients around the world. And as you'll hear shortly, the horrible opioid crisis that we are uh, uh, experiencing now, and I hate to say it, but uh, while far and away the problem is the worst in the United States, number two in the world is Australia, and it's a growing problem in Australia as well. And so we are now very much focused on trying to address the opioid crisis and provide an alternative with neuromodulation, and then provide advocacy for our patients and for our practitioners so that we can help. 
And uh, there is a website, neuromodulation.com. You all have access to it. And we often will get emails from patients or, or physicians around the world asking for us to help or to lead them in the direction that they need to get access to these therapies. As I mentioned, we have a journal, which is the only journal that is dedicated specifically to these therapies, of which I've been the editor-in-chief for many years. And while I'm president of the society, Dr. Robert Foreman has taken over for me during that period. And we have the website, as I mentioned, that has open access uh, for you, for the public, um, to get information as you need to. And this is just one of the website slides, and you can see that, that one of our primary efforts is over there in that right-hand column is to be able to provide information for patients and the public as well. I thank you all so much for your attendance, and I hope that over the next you know, few hours, we can answer many of the questions that you have and try to help you um, direct yourselves, your friends, your loved ones, or whoever may benefit from these therapies to one of the fine doctors here in Australia who might be able to help.